idea. All right, well, according to my clock, we're at the top of the hour. So I just want to let everybody know I am recording and I'm doing that just so I can post it for those of us um, or those in the course that couldn't join us today. Um, and just as a matter of logistics, uh, please do feel free at any moment to unmute yourself. Everyone who comes in is muted and um, that's on purpose so we don't get a lot of background uh, weird noises. Um, but if you're you know, ready to talk, you know, please feel free um, just, to, just to unmute your mic and start talking. Same with your video. Um, depending on what your bandwidth is like and if you're um, if you're if you want to show your lovely face feel free to turn on your webcam um, so with that I'm just gonna uh, go through a couple of really quick slides and then I really want to be quiet and let everybody else have a chance to talk um, but I just want to make sure um, this is one of the only times I've had a chance to verbally and, and with my face while we're looking at you um, talk about what this class is about and why we're offering it um, so uh, certainly if you're, you've signed up for the class, you know it's a mobile learning strategies class. And hopefully everybody knows, I was just mentioning before we, um, we, before we started, if there's any confusion, this is not a class where you're going to learn how to develop mobile applications. We're actually going to be using off-the-shelf apps, so what you find in the App Store or in the Google Play Store, whichever your, uh, your platform is. And so the idea is to think through ways you can take this, the technology that you already have and the applications that have already been developed and use that as a tool to facilitate learning strategies. And so um, for anyone who's joining us that maybe isn't enrolled in the course, because I've been post posting this all over, if this is something that sounds interesting as we're going through, if you hop over to our website, we're um, Designers for Learning, we're a nonprofit, a 501c3 nonprofit in the United States. Um, and if you hop over to our website, designersforlearning.org slash mobile design sprint, you'll get a, a frequently asked questions page that will take you through the idea behind the course, why we're offering it, what you can expect out of it, and, um, and then also a link to enroll if you're, if you're interested. So before I start in, does, does anybody want to start out with any comments or questions? I guess one thing I'm very interested in is, uh, you know, what, what do you think about Thinkific? This is a test. Thinkific, by the way, is the platform we're using to host the design sprint. It's brand new to us at Designers for Learning. And I just wondered, did anybody have any thoughts before we jump in on that or uh, comments and questions on, on how things are going with finding materials in the class and how we've arranged things? Please feel, I'll just stop for a second and let you add any thoughts. Yeah, Jen, it is similar to Teachable. Uh, Jennifer, have you used, I don't know if you want to use, you know, pull up your microphone. Um, have you used Teachable before? I have not, but that was a decision point I had between Teachable, Thinkific, and a couple other ones. Actually, I haven't, but I'm about to sign up for it, so I'm kind of glad that I'll have a taste of it here so that I can see the difference. Um, so, not yeah. yet. And so for those that aren't familiar with these platforms, a lot of us are probably in higher ed, I'm guessing, um, and are familiar with Canvas or Blackboard. Um, so these um, other platforms that we're talking about, Teachable and Thinkific, are uh, geared more for um, when you're trying to uh, offer a course outside of a main institution like a university or something like that. So if I, for example, we're offering it here in our nonprofit, but certainly you as an individual, if you have something you want to offer, just one off course, you can do it, or you, you have a series of courses and um, they offer the ability to charge for the courses and have uh, certificates and things like that. And just for your uh, benefit, Jennifer, the reason I took Thinkific over Teachable I wasn't real keen on the way Teachable um, makes you, uh, as soon as the course goes live or it's published, anybody can enroll. And I wanted to pre-sell the course and, and you know, talk it up beforehand to give people an idea what it was about. And it was a little bit harder process to do that. So um, that was, honestly, that was one of the biggest reasons because otherwise from a feature standpoint, it was pretty, it was pretty similar. So in fact, I, I, I use a lot of the, I signed up for Teachable on a free um, account and I, um, I use that. I use their materials. So, anything else before we get going? And again, for those that are just joining, feel feel free to use the t uh, the group chat, the back channel uh, text chat. I'm very um, fine with that. In fact, I encourage it. So, what I really wanted to do in these few, first few slides is just give you the kind of the backbones of the course and and what you can kind of uh, expect and, and kind of give you a conceptual framework. At least my conceptual framework as the designer. Again, hopefully uh, you you find these um, interactions to be how I planned them. But if not, that's this is the first time we're offering it. This is a good chance for me to get feedback on things that we may want to look at when we offer it in the future. 
But in the in the um, in a nutshell, we're we're following a model of a design sprint, and there's lots of models. If you go out on Google and type in design sprint, there are lots of different iterations, and we're following a model used by Google Ventures. And yes, it's that Google. So when they decide they're going to uh, put money into a new venture or um, working with uh, as like in a consulting cap capacity. Um, they use this format as a way to take their idea from a need all the way through to user testing. And so we're using the same idea, the same five-stage approach. We're not using their same um, process. They use a five-day in-person, face-to-face process, which is not really conducive to us as a global network of people <laughs> logging in at different times and having real lives with jobs and families. So we decided to stretch it out over the course of three months, take as much time as you need. But as far, as far as the guts of what we're doing within the phases, the, uh, the design sprint begins with targeting a need. Um, in our case, we're going to be targeting adult basic education, and we're going to be looking at ways you can take existing lesson plans that have been developed and primarily developed in a face-to-face -face setting, sometimes in, with some degree of online learning, maybe in a blended learning um, format. But um, the idea being take some component of that lesson plan and figure out a way that you can incorporate it and facilitate it using a mobile device. And so that's the first stage, thinking about the learner, the context, and the need. And then we're going to spend time in the second stage really getting into ideas of how we could take that lesson and figure out ways that we could use off-the-shelf apps using uh, mobile devices, smartphones, tablets, to facilitate uh, a learning interaction. We're talking about a very short duration learning interaction because this is a sprint uh, when we aren't trying to solve all the world's problems. We really are asking you to think about a, 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 a learning intervention, a learning experience that would take the learner about 15 minutes. And that doesn't sound like very much time until you start designing it. And then that's when the, the clock starts you know, uh, churning away because you're what we're asking you to do, as you can see in design, um, the phases, design phase uh, three, four, and five, we're asking you to storyboard your idea, which takes time. We're asking you to prototype it, getting your materials together, and finally user testing it. So all of those things we estimate will take the average person about, about 20 hours to do. If you participated in one of our courses before, you may be, able to, may be able to shave some time off of that because you probably spent a lot of time already thinking about the need and the learner and the context, and you'll be thinking more now about stages two through five. And it may take you a little bit longer if you're not as familiar with adult basic education and if you're not as familiar with our approach to, to design and some of the, the techniques and some of the approaches and philosophies and principles that we try to embed within our lesson. It may take you a little bit longer um, you know, to read through all of the materials. So this really, uh, on one ugly slide, this really visually is a very hideous slide, <laughs> but I just threw this up quickly to say, to give this idea that, okay, we've got all these lessons that are out there in a, in a face-to-face, so here you have a sage on the stage for a teacher standing up at the board talking to the adult learners. Um, and we're trying to think about how you could take learner-to-content interactions or learner-to-learner -learner interactions or learner-to-instruction um, interactions and how you could facilitate um, again, a 15-minute interaction, how you could facilitate that using a mobile device. And I, I really wanted to spend a little bit of time on this. Again, I'm, I promise I'm going to be quiet very, very shortly here. Um, but I think this is a pretty important handout. It's in the course. It's in the second stage, I believe. Um, and it, this is how, in my, my mind as a designer, when I design any learning experience, this is the conceptual framework, this is the matrix that pops into my head. And let me just spend a couple seconds or a couple minutes probably talking about what it, what it is. So if you look at the columns on the left in the blue, um, anyone who's familiar with Merrill's first principles of instruction or some who are maybe joining us from the adult basic education community may be familiar with a lesson planning framework called WAPIA. So it's warm up, introduction, presentation practice, evaluation and application, I think. I, I, might, I may have those uh, out of order a little bit. But basically, those are the phases that if you go through and do a post-mortem on most instructional experiences and most effective in instructional experiences, they're going to have those principles embedded within them. They may not be in that order. It may not. In fact, some of the best instruction may not start with an introduction. You may hit them with something and then you have them go out and do something uh, with pra involving practice, but then come back and, and, and kind of explain why they did that. So it may not necessarily 
be in a lockstep order, but those are pretty much in those, those uh, rows that go across on the activation, demonstration, application, and integration. Those are the phases of instruction that typically occur um, in most learning interventions. And then across the top, if you think about what a learner's doing, we refer to that as an interaction. So what is the learner doing during the uh, instruction? If you simplify all the potential things that they could do, it tends to fall into these three uh, columns that are coming down in the green. Um, they're either uh, interacting with other learners, they're either interacting, uh, or potentially interacting with the instructor, or uh, in third, inter interacting in some way with the content. And you can maybe stretch that out, and now, especially in our world of social networking, you can certainly extend this out to maybe a fourth column where you're reaching out to experts or others that are outside of the main learning domain. But I tend to include that in either the learner to instructor being kind of the expert or within the learner to learner. Uh, but certainly you could add a fourth column. And so what that ends up being, when you think of it in these terms, you're kind of thinking about 12 different learner, act, learner interactions that you could be designing at any one time. And so um, I wanted to also make pretty clear, there is no value judgment across those columns. There's been a lot of research and I cite some of it within the course. Um, certainly if you talk to a social cognitivist or a social constructivist, they're going to tell you they'd lean pretty heavily to let's have more learner to learner interactions and stay away from that second column, the learner to, in, to, uh, learner to instructor. Um, if you talk to other folks, they'll say, nope, there's a lot of value to, uh, you know, keeping the learner very engaged with content, working individually, working alone. We're not going to get into those debates necessarily in this class, or at least I'm not planning to engage in heavy debate on um, which of those 12 areas you should spend your time. They're all very, um, they're all very important. And so since that's kind of very conceptual and all in the mind right now, let's kind of pull it back to reality here and talk about some examples within a mobile learning context of what I'm talking about. So let's look at, for example, if you look at the, one of my favorite ones here. Okay, let's look at learner to learner interaction as a demonstration or a presentation type activity. So let's say you have um, a group of students and you want them to, let's use an example of, you want them to think about budgeting. And so uh, maybe this is a, a, one of the lessons you're teaching in your adult basic education of you have uh, $75 that has to stretch through your week of, of grocery shopping. Um, run to the grocery store on your free time when you're not in class, obviously, when, when you're, the, you're off on your own, and have a scavenger hunt. So use your mobile device to potentially take photographs of like various prices at the store, um, maybe um, figure out a menu that you needed to buy all the items for. How would you use that $75 to buy all the groceries, groceries you need? I think it would be a really cool, again, using that concept of like a scavenger hunt using your mobile device um, to do that. Or, or use um, maybe uh, have them text in um, uh, examples or um, interview people you know it may be interview their parents or if you know if it's a, a, a younger person in there interviewing a parent or someone who regularly does this use the video feature on your mobile device to uh, to interview who's someone who does this so I think that would be a kind of a cool way to get the student engaged with Certainly they're getting involved with the content, but they're also reaching out and um, either working with peer learners or again using that idea of someone outside of the classroom um, to, as an expert who may be able to, um, to help. And again, it's kind of get, getting them a hands-on practice doing that. Another example might be uh, for a practice or an application over on the right-hand column. Maybe you'd like your students to, over the semester or the course um, develop some type of e-portfolio or maybe you have a class blog and you want to teach them how to make small posts to the blog using their mobile device certainly on WordPress for example you can um, use your mobile phone very quickly to type make, make a quick little type a type of very quick blog post um, again using the idea of images or videos using your phone to do that and then post them to some type of portfolio that you've created um, and then lots of examples for using with the um, instructor working with the student. Uh, maybe um, you want to offer the example I have there for um, an oral exam. Do it kind of like what we're doing here. 
on their mobile device use a Google Hangout or something like that or a FaceTime um, and have the student, um, and rather than come to you or come to class or meet together, use the mobile device that they probably have in their hands, in their pocket, in their purse, whatever, and fire that up as a means to, to have that one-to-one um, -that -one interaction. Um, and so with that, I'm just going to pause for a minute because that was quite a lot of stuff. <laughs> So I'm just curious, is, let, let's kind of start talking about this and, and parsing what I'm talking about. Um, is this, how does this sit with you? How, how does this compare to how you think about a learner experience and when you're designing instruction, how you're thinking about laying out the learning, uh, learning experience? Feel free to jump in. I like it. It seems very practical and, and straightforward and just accounting for those different steps in that in those interactions. But uh, as you say, I think a lot of it depends on, on where you're coming from in terms of what you see as the prime interaction. And I like the, the learner to learner would be my preference. Yeah. So yeah, Doug, I don't know how far you are um, or anybody wants to jump in. I don't, I'm probably going to put Doug on the spot because I know Doug pretty <laughs> well. But <laughs> feel free to jump in anybody. Um, have you had a chance to look at any lesson plans at all or um, think about what I, you're able to do? I have, and, and the one that jumped out at me was the portfolio, just to see, again, particularly for people that only have mobile devices as a, as a means of accessing the web in terms of what could be done for them. Um, I think particularly for, for um, you know, um, remedial adult learners, a lot of them do have some type of mobile device, but they do not have access to to uh, computers proper. So how does, how do you introduce them to that world? And, and the first thing that I thought of then was, well, what free spaces could I use in terms of um, do, and then, then the next thing I thought about was how do you, how do you get to that? How do you lower that access point as low as you can with mobile devices? Because obviously you could go down as far as text, but I don't know how much you could actually do with text or how practical that would be. And then, is it a matter of you know um, free Wi-Fi or hotspots to get web connection for for photos and those kind of things? So yeah, it's uh, yeah. But you, you bring up a great point, um, and I do have some. If you when you're in the, I have time to drill down on it. I, I pulled up some um, some research that's been done on mobile use in um, the population we're talking about, and in particular low income, which may not necessarily mm -hmm. be the population. You know, our population may not necessarily be low income, but um, they may have other you know reasons that they're taking adult education. But for the most part, probably it, it's probably correlated with income to some degree. And um, as you said, maybe it's not a smartphone, but at least it's a cell phone where you can text. And, yes. um, um, and I'll, when, when I'm, I can't walk and chew gum very well, but there is a, um, <laughs> there's a, an organization called Cell Ed, and I don't think it's just playing out C-E-L-L-E-D dot org. I don't think it's that. I, th I think there's like a hash or you know, underscore sure. or something like that. But yeah, um, I'll look it up. But they're, um, I've heard them give several presentations at adult education seminars, and um, they really are kind of looking at the lowest common denominator technology, um, so really where you can just basically text, you know, not necessarily right. even get on the internet. And um, it's kind of cool, they've, they've had it where you could, you know, you certainly can find a way to send out group texts and say, mm -hmm. make a prompt. Um, and so this one that's sticking in my head was in English um, as a second language course and so it was very simple um, prompts for um, you know say this think of how you would say this phrase in English you know maybe it's in Spanish to English and then mm -hmm. everyone would pound away and like quickly come up with a thing just as they're sitting there you know the idea being you know you're sitting watching you know whatever at night on television and you're like oh cool I got a little prompt and then you just spend a little time working on it and um, it's again to augment what maybe they were doing in the classroom um, right. But that, they had some pretty, pretty cool things. And from my phone, I recall, if you go to their website, they have some other examples of things they've done. Excellent, because the, the quality to that is the notion of, of remote communities with, with low bandwidth access. So even if they do have computers, they don't have that robust enough connection for streaming video or, or different things that are um, bandwidth intensive. Yeah. Yeah, and that's true. Trip, uh, Patricia is bringing up, you're getting some good um, comments. Um, yeah, the virtual free field trip idea um, that, that Debbie brought up. Um, and then um, so, uh, Patricia's mentioning, you know, it, that's a great point. As a designer, you're always making assumptions about your opportunities and your constraints. 
And so, um, as Doug noted, you, maybe at home they don't have internet. Maybe they have a cell phone um, and, you, and they don't maybe want to use up all their, their um, or I'm sorry, a smartphone, but they don't necessarily want to use up all their minutes. Um, certainly, if you say, oh, if you could head to the public library um, and upload your photos or upload your video or whatever it may be, you know, that's certainly an op opportunity. And then also to computer use on the library, right? If it's something that you want to kind of go beyond what they may be able to have. Um, and then Jennifer mentioned some students cannot make it. To, yeah, no trans. Yeah, we hear that a lot. No, tra I'm reading Jennifer Meyer's comments here. Um, some students just can't make it to the uh, to a computer. Childcare issues always are a concern. Um, if you're working all day and you're going to classes at night, how do you, how do you have time to go? You know, squeeze in time to the to the library. Now that's a really. I wanted to also bring up too. I love constraints. So a lot of people freak out about constraints. I have no problem <laughs> with constraints. It's just an extra fun challenge. So in this project, you're setting your own constraints. So when you're thinking through your project, um, you, you know, if, you're, if you want your students to be able to use a certain device, just state so. You know, just state it. Don't worry about you know, coming to me or coming you know, to, to some subject matter expert or whatever to, to find out, like, is this practical? The kind of cool thing about our project is you can define what the context and the constraints are for, for what you're talking about. Did anybody else want to jump in? I don't know how far folks are along in the course. Um, would anyone else like to kind of jump in and, and talk about what they thought about as some of these learner inter interactions they might be um, designing? And maybe we're not to that point, but that's okay. Early thoughts are good too. Okay. Well, feel free to interrupt me and certainly use the text chat if you're um, if you're starting to think through some ideas. That's what we're here to talk about. I just have a couple more slides that I, wa I wanted to talk about. I um, did try, it, as I've said a couple times already, uh, Thinkific has been great as a con kind of a content management, but there's some of the, the learner to learner interactions within our design sprint that have been a little bit of a frustration. And so um, I have pushed out some of those opportunities to hopefully people will use Twitter. We have a, a Facebook group um, and all of this is very well documented within the class. You can find where all these things are within the design sprint. Um, and we also have um, sandboxes that I've created and the sandbox essentially is just I've, I've set up a little installation of something and you can go and pound away and try it. So a couple of the, a couple or three or four different um, pieces of technology have been kind of rising to the top is potential applications you may want to think about, certainly not required. And I could also come up with all kinds of constraints and reasons why these technologies wouldn't work in, in some cases. Um, but you probably heard or have used Slack, for example. Um, Digo is a social bookmarking platform, which again would be a great learner to learner interaction. So if you taught your, your uh, learners how to use Digo to bookmark when they come across resources, and so we're going to try, uh, kind of try before we use them in our design. So I've set up um, a Slack channel. Um, we, we have a Digo group. And then Padlet, which is really a, a neat um, potential option. It's basically an online bulletin board, like I think of like a cork board that you put like a push pin in. And um, so you can do a lot of things with that. You can put text there. You can put videos. You can put pictures. You can then have comments beneath each post. So, so you know you can use it like a blog maybe or you could just use it as like a portfolio display spot um, lots of different things and so those are all at the end of each of our stages I have a share and compare and um, and that's yeah, your opportunity to again com you know mingle with the hundred or so people that are um, currently enrolled in the course to uh, to try to think through things and then we also have um, other opportunities that are kind of going parallel to our class there's a, a group right now um, really exploring this idea of digital citizenship, um, and they're um, pretty active on Twitter right now under the hashtag of DigCiz, D-I-G-C-I-Z. Um, and it's this idea of um, if you're bringing um, your student, and it is educators for the most part contemplating this, but it's thinking about what, you know, what do you need to contemplate about um, throwing your class onto social media, onto Twitter. And um, it's been kind of an interesting question to follow because some are even saying, well, what is it? Like, what is digital citizenship? Is it a thing we can define? Is it a subjective thing or is it an objective thing? And, um, and how should we, how sh should we, um, should we foster it? And if so, how should we foster it? 
So that's kind of a cool, um, and that came up actually, someone in our course was um, saying he was, he felt that before you use social media in a course, you should have some type of a lesson or preamble about this idea of digital citizenship. And, it, and again, I'm not going to sit here and define it because it's, it's kind of a vague concept, but it could be as, um, uh, in terms of um, d decorum and um, you know how to have a conversation. It could be as, something like that all the way through to what's your role in a social media setting. Um, are, is it fair to just be a lurker and let everyone else do things? You know, you can really take it, um, you know, quite quite down far the line on on the continuum of what digital citizenship is. But it's a it's a really cool uh, conversation that's happening parallel to our class. Um, and then within our LinkedIn group, we do have a little bit of a dialogue starting um, on this whole idea of is a mobile device does it have the features and affordances that we should be using to facilitate robust learning experiences. Um, and I think it's a great con conversation to have because anyone who's tried, for example, to read a PDF on a smartphone, it's not great. And so um, if, if you're thinking about having someone read a novel, <laughs> I'm not sure if we're going to want to have them read it on their, on their smartphone. So I, I kind of think about it in, in terms of the time and the place aspect of a mobile device. Um, there's probably a better time and a place to use a mobile device than others. And always keeping in mind this idea of what is the best choice to make things effective, efficient, and engaging. And um, it's kind of, we just had a very minimal conversation started, but I hope folks will jump over to LinkedIn and the group and, and pick up on that and start thinking about some of those um, conversations and the screen being small and as you guys have already mentioned um, in the tech text chat here this these ideas of um, how much internet bandwidth do you need how much what type of plan do you need are you know if we're asking students to do something even texting are, are we confident that they have a plan that they're not going to get suddenly socked with a $200 bill because all of a sudden these text messages are going flying crazy um, so those are all types of things to think about um, the features and the affordances of the of the device and using the devices that um, that could come into play. Um, and that's about it. I think that really I'm going to be quiet now for the next half hour as long as we want to sit here. Um, oh, oh, Heidi mentioned she's used Padlet. I don't know if you have your um, audio with you, um, Heidi. Did you want to share with us your thoughts on Padlet? Got a quiet crew. Feel free, jump in. Yeah. Um. Sorry. No. Um, <laughs> Padlet. I mean, it's pretty cool. It's kind of like um a discussion board, but with a little bit more visual elements. Um, and I think that kind of helps because you can kind of organize and you can drag and drop different parts of the discussion as well. So. So what do you think about Padlet for our learner audience? Um, you know, some of the ones are, that we're targeting may only have a reading level of equivalent to like fifth grade or, you know, or even lower in some cases. I think it would, it's, it's a little bit more user friendly than like your average learning management system. So I think it would be a better option um, because it's just kind of like click on this sticky note, type something in type of deal. Mm -hmm. And is it hard? I played just with it a little bit. Is it hard? Have you tried it on a mobile device at all? Um, I don't, I don't know if I've used it too much on mobile devices. I don't really remember. Um, but I think from what I remember, it's pretty easy. I think the only thing is you, uh, you have to scroll to see the entire bullet bulletin board okay. and on the computer, you don't really have to do that. Right. You know, that, that brings up another point. Um, some of these mobile technologies aren't necessarily apps. It may be that they're just accessing it on um, the browser within the, um, like Safari or if you have an iPhone, for example. Um, and that may be the, I can't recall on Padlet. A couple of them that I had recommended people check out were not necessarily apps, but um, you're, you know, you're, you're still accessing it, the same type of URL that you would on, on a desktop. Um, Cool. So do you have any thoughts on your project yet, Heidi, as long as I've got you? <laughs> it's a captive uh, <laughs> participant here. <laughs> um, 
I think I'm going to, there is a lesson plan I saw where it's um, looking at different news stories and kind of, I, I think that the idea is judging the credibility of different news stories. Mm -hmm. um, but I haven't decided yet in what direction I want to go for mobile. Um, I know that it's, going to be easy for students to look up news stories on the mobile device, but I'm not really sure what I want to do yet as far as the lesson. Right, right, right. Yeah, that's a, that's a good one. And you know, it's interesting. Um, I'm, I'm a, I was a little hesitant. Um, well, we have like 86 lessons, lesson plans that are there. Um, and again, we have 20 hour, I'm trying to keep this to like a 20 some hour experience. So rather than have you design an entire new lesson and then just figure out, you know, carve out 15 minute um, but if if this comes up please just let me know but if you, if you read through them and you're like I don't really like any of these 86 lessons or I have something that I completely want to try different that's fine too I was using that as kind of a, a way to contain how much work you need to do you know the idea of going to to one of the other lessons um, but like I said there are 86 of them so hopefully there's something within there you can find their value that's great um, did you think about um, any of the technologies you might want to try at all? No, I haven't yet. Um, there's just so much out there. I'm just kind of looking forward to seeing what other people think are the best options and kind of going from there. Yeah. So did anybody, um, you guys are, Heidi or Doug or anybody who hasn't spoken yet, anybody have any questions as far as this um, idea of the, the sprint? Anything that you're, I don't know how far, again, everybody's at different points, but, you know, the storyboarding or prototyping or user testing. I think the user testing for me is kind of the most exciting part. That'll be interesting to see how people enjoy that aspect of the design sprint. Um, when I did my example for this course I had my husband I don't know Doug you remember my husband's name is Tom and so he was my user um, just to try it out see what he thought I used a, a voice recording app on it's kind of it's, it's not necessarily like it's native to the iPhone but it's, it's put out by Apple and um, so you can just make little voice recordings and I as you'll see in the course is my example I had um, the idea it's a the lesson was about interviews and I thought that the kind of a weakness of the, it was a great lesson, but it was kind of just flat at the end as far as the integration, like the idea with integration being, okay, you've learned all this material, how will you actually use this in your real life? And so the idea with then using the voice recording is, well, anytime you have um, the need or whatever to practice, you'll fire up this vo voice recording, which is just sitting there on your phone and um, the lesson gives the student a prompt to think about that you, a question you may get on an interview record it and then go back and listen. Listen to yourself. Was, did you say a bunch of ums, which I usually always do? Uh, were you saying what you, what you thought you were saying? You, know, you may remember what you're saying, but when you actually hear it come back. Um, and so that was the, it's a very simple lesson. In my um, learner audience, I believe I was assuming the reading level was very low, you know, certainly at like maybe third grade. Um, so a lot of visual images and a, you know, not, a lot of, not a lot of words within the lesson materials. Let's see, we have any other comments or questions? Oh, great. Oh, Sabrina, so you should meet your new, are you, uh, Sabrina, are you in an instructional design program now, your master's program? And you can either voice it or type in the text chat. Oh, third semester, okay, great. So um, one of the reasons we founded Designers for Learning, I was teaching as an adjunct at Old Dominion University and all, everyone on our board is faculty at different colleges. And while well, everybody's really proud of their programs and I went to a great master's and PhD program, probably the missing piece to the puzzle is always the practical experience. And so that's where we felt Designers for Learning could, um, could help the field. It's giving opportunities for people to to think about a real context. And then again, the cool part of what we do is the resources that you develop, the idea being um, these will be used by real educators. I, we talk to educators all the time and we're trying to think through ways to make it even easier for them to find our resources and, and, and implement them in their classrooms. So it's not like, a, as David Wiley calls it, it's not a disposable assignment. What you do really will have a very good chance of being uh, picked up by a, a teacher at some point and used in the classroom. Okay, anybody else? 
Anybody have any questions? Thoughts, ideas? Does anybody have any suggestions on, um, as I mentioned, um, kind of the Achilles heel of Thinkific for me is the social interaction. As Doug said, he's a big proponent, as I am too, a learner to learner interaction. Um, anybody else have any th thoughts on how we could um, try to encourage that within the within design sprint, things we might not be doing yet? This is such a quiet group. Let's talk, it's fine. <laughs> I was just going to throw out there, maybe there's some um, some possibilities with regards to hashtagging or something in social media in terms of people finding each other related to maybe subgroups related to um, areas of expertise as people get further along or areas of interest as people get further along with the course in terms of maybe some some beta testing before the user testing proper and that kind of thing. That'd be great. And maybe we could do that, Doug, as like uh, one of the open houses is you know, mm -hmm. use that as an opportunity for people to kind of pitch their ideas. Yeah, and um, to, to Doug's point, we have one generic hashtag we're using, Mobile Sprint. Um, so if you, you're on, mainly on Twitter uh, and Facebook is where we're using that. Um, but if there's other um, ways you wanna figure out, that might be kind of a cool question, or not cool, but like relevant question, I should say. How many people in this group that we have right now, we've got 11 of us on here, how many are on Twitter? or use Twitter fairly regularly for? <laughs> so Jennifer's saying rarely. Uh, by the way, we've got design form. That's our designer's form. Diana's never, okay. Often for Academy and cool. Have one not active, yeah. See, that's the problem, I mean, um, a constraint. It's, it's a design constraint for me. It's like finding a finding a home for everybody to um, to connect and interact. Patricia, yeah, never as well. On Debbie, we feel yeah. Oh, sorry, Jen. I was just going to say that that's obviously a a big factor in terms of of your design in terms of how just that whole recognizing that not, maybe not everyone is as familiar or is as free to post things on different social media spaces as you might be. Again, particularly for literacy learners where they may have uh, some issues with regards to getting their stuff up there or being self-conscious of posting in those spaces. Yeah, that's a great point. And Candace mentioned she's on Facebook and not Twitter. Um, another thing that comes up, most, or not most people, I, I get it, I tend to generalize and I have to always back off. Uh, a lot of people mm -hmm. consider Facebook to be a social platform where you go and talk with your family and your friends and post pictures of your kids or whatever. And mm -hmm. isn't necessarily the place where you want to start talking about your deep thoughts on, you know, World War II, <laughs> you know, whatever the topic may be. Because um, I don't, it's kind of, I think pretty much everything you post, it just shows up on your feed. So right. you get a picture of your <laughs> birthday party and then your thoughts yeah. on Hitler. You know, it's just a little, a little odd. A little awkward. And for me, that quickly comes back to the digital citizenship notion of who are you and who do you want to be online? And do you, like, I know a lot of people try to delineate personal and professional. And I know a lot of people who've started off that way, who've gotten away from it just because it's almost self-induced schizophrenia at a certain point where they have to remember what they're saying and in which one and, and and again that's just obviously as we mentioned earlier we've been playing in these spaces for a long time so we probably come to a point where we're comfortable with what our public voice is but that's mm -hmm. that's something that takes time definitely yeah oh sabrina made a comment here um you something like yeah google translate um that's a great idea as a portuguese speaker i learned english on my own oh that's that's awesome um yeah, I think that would be really cool. That would be really cool. And that, you know, brings up an, a point um, is, you know, we're talking about using the, the technology as a tool for facilitating some type of lesson, but there is also this idea, of it would take a while to teach somebody even how to use Google Translate, you know, so that could almost mm -hmm. be a 15 minute lesson in and of itself is like, how do you use Google Translate? Um, you, know, you know, I wanted to just say something about, going back to your point on social interaction. Mm -hmm. I guess, I think, Mobile learning is, is excellent as, as a supplementary tool. Some people, you know, well, and mostly our students, I think, um, are going to be going to face-to-face -to -face 
instruction. I think that that's, and, and so I don't think social interaction is particularly an issue. However, it, I think it's an issue when you have a class so, solely on, <laughs> on te technological, you know, mobile, either your mobile device or, or online. You know what I mean? Because I, I, I'm just going back to your point about social interaction. And I'm so, not sure it's an issue so much for the students that we're going to work with because I think that lot, most of the time, I think they will be attending, if they can, a class. And the, the mobile device just makes an added, another way that they can uh, learn because when they're at home and they're not in class, then this is a way to, to keep them, you know, dealing. I, I work with citizenship, so I could send them easily a question, one of the 100 questions that they have to memorize. And, and we could send it out. Does that make sense? Totally. And just for everyone that's here, Patricia is a, you're, you're an adult basic education rock star. I will just. Uh, no, 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 no. <laughs> yes, you are. Yes, you are. You do. You do the good work, um, which is amazing. And you're in California. Is that right? That's correct. Yes. Yeah. Southern, Southern California. Is that right? Yes, uh -huh. In the L Los Angeles area. Yeah. And so if you've had a chance, um, I'll definitely make sure I've, in our uh, in, uh, email I send out, um, Patricia was a uh, subject matter expert on a panel we had when, in our first MOOC. And we really wanted uh, a group of educators to come on and talk to us about the context because it's very foreign to many of us who are more familiar with higher education or maybe K-12. Um, and, um, you know, Patricia, I think, did a great job of talking about, I think you said at the time, if I'm remembering correctly, you, you, you do field trips, right? Like, like physical field trips. Oh, yes. Oh, no. That's, uh, that, you have to take the student out into the world, and most of them haven't been a my nice student, but I mean, I can, I've worked with students who are immigrants, and I've worked with students who are from here, and in both cases, you take them out because you need to experience the world, and, and, the, and most of them, haven't been to the places that you take them. So, <laughs> so, that's yeah. really good. Yeah. so, and you know, I don't know if you were on when I was talking about this idea of the scavenger hunt, you know, this uh -huh. idea like use your mobile device as a way mm -hmm. to capture images. So, you know, maybe if you're rather, if, if it's a situation where you can't take everybody to the museum or whatever the thing is that you're doing, you know, say, uh, you know, on your own Tuesday, it's free museum day or whatever, you know, if you could try to get yourself there and you know, take pictures well, or whatever I, it may be. Yeah. I, I was at a conference not so long ago and there was a, a presentation about Hangouts, which is related to uh, Google right there. Right. And there was higher ed, and that's what she had. She was talking about the students would go on a, on a digital scavenger hunt so that they would have to go out and upload the picture that they had so that, you know, everybody was on. She didn't go with them. So in other words, she wasn't going on the field trip, but the students, you know, separately went out. And then the, the thing that brought them all together was the Hangout, the the, you know, that everybody submitted something up and to uploaded something up into their, you know, up into online. That's wonderful. You know, and maybe, and again, every context is so different, Patricia, but if you could help us, it, it does come up a lot. Um, and we've kind of touched on it here. As far as making a basic assumption of what technology the students may have available, because we're cracking a lot of, you know, this whole idea of BYOD, which is bring your own device. You know, we're not thinking about having like an iPad we give all the students. It's we're kind of relying on what the device they may have access to. What, from your experience, is it a fairly safe assumption in the state of California, Southern California, to make an assumption that they would have a smartphone? Yes. I, see, I was just going to, I was going to share that. Um, I, I teach citizenship where we've just started our summer break and they need to continue studying. You can't just take a two month break. And so um, I sat them down with, we have uh, at the at school, we have laptops. So a lot of them hadn't, hadn't felt a laptop before, but you walk them through a laptop, um, several of them uh, had, and we could get them to send emails to their representatives and lo and behold, they were, they got a response. They just, wow. oh my God, that was like, that's very cool. You know, I do even email blasts. The people who have email, I send to them and say, okay, remember we have class or this is a holiday or blah, 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 blah. And they were so excited when they, A, got a response from the representative. But B, my point in, in teaching them was so that in the summertime, there are online, uh, immigration, INS has online materials for them to study. And so uh, most of them don't have computers. But I said, let's go to the library. There's one right next to you. And you can you can reserve time on that. But let's then in class, see, you know, I ran them down. Let's go through it so you know how to do it. I gave them a sheet so they could take it home. 
step by step of how to access. Does that make sense to you? Totally. Yeah. Most of them have have uh, cell phones. There's not any question about that. And I think most of them, most of them will have uh, access to the internet via, but they don't know very much. Just, uh, uh, you know, the people who haven't been to school, uh, you know, in citizenship, you get all, you get people with university, and you get people who who haven't been to school at all. So, but the the adult basic ed person, um, there are some who, you know, because they like to be able to communicate with their family in their country, they might have, they, they would know about uh, internet access and that would be, you know, they use, uh, what is it, uh, FaceTime, but, you know, they'll, they'll communicate with the family that way, yes. So they won't be totally, I mean, and it depends on age. A lot of times this is an age issue, an older person, well, you know, they'll have a telephone, but they won't know how to do it. You make, use all its features, that kind of thing. So. Right, right. Uh, well, we have a perfect opportunity. If, if anyone has a question about our um, adult learners, uh, Patricia, again, every context is, you can't make a total generalization about every adult ed context, but um, I certainly have bounced a lot of ideas off our subject matter experts in the past, and, and certainly they've, they've been great. It, dialing it back for me or having me dial it back <laughs> saying you're you're going too far on some assumption and so um, If you have any uh, questions that Patricia might be able to answer feel free to to do so Jennifer do you have people outside of the United States in this class? We do we do um, a couple from um, and one problem Again, I'm kind of bashing think of it rather than, uh, when, rather than plugging it, but um, I have a hard time telling where people are in this platform versus some others I've used. Um, but I just know from, um, from people we've met with China, um, at, um, different places in Africa. Um, I'm just trying to think. Uh, well, Doug's in Canada. Does that count? <laughs> you can be, I hope so. We'll call that international. <laughs> I don't know. It's all kind of fuzzy. <laughs> And that's that's quite interesting in terms of Canada um, all the forms that we have in our provincial and federal governments are all accessed online now so people that don't have online access can't access government services so obviously that's a that's a major issue for for those who need it right right yeah even just sending it as you said um, Patricia figuring out a way to send an email to your um, representatives things like that I mean what what a great lesson to walk away with like I said, I'm pretty much done with what I wanted to talk about, but I'm, I'm more than happy to stay as long as people want as far as questions, um, points in the right direction. As I said, Patricia is a wonderful person, and I'm sure she would you know, love to share her experience if anybody has any questions for her as well. Okay, well, I guess... We're winding down. We're getting the thank you, so I guess that we're winding down. <laughs> so, well, I'll try to um, hold at least two more of these, maybe three. I love Doug's idea that we kind of came across this idea of maybe having a um, um, share and compare um, design slam of some sort as we get a design pitch, I guess would be a great, good way to put it as we move along. So, mm -hmm. Okay, well, thank you, everybody. Have a great week, and um, thank you so much for joining, too. I really not tell you how I appreciate it. 100 people was our stretch goal and we're already past it in the first week. So who knows where we'll get by August. I'm really happy. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Janet. Thanks for this opportunity. It's a lot of fun. I really appreciate it. Thanks, Doug. Bye-bye. Good to talk to everybody. Bye-bye.